Well, this morning we've been going through Matthew chapter 8, talking about the power of Jesus in this series, and it's, uh, it's been pretty powerful. I mean, last week was really neat, um, just seeing people come up here, getting prayed for, for healing, and uh, just an amazing thing that the God's doing uh, through this series, and it's just, it's been really exciting and a very timely message, too, I think going through Matthew chapter 8, um, just seeing how he heals people in so many different ways and puts his power on display. And uh, so hopefully this morning, we're going to look at how he has the power to heal. He has authority over all kinds of different things, but he has authority even over nature itself, uh, the wind and the waves, over all his creation. And uh, so hopefully this morning, we'll, we'll end up giving the authority of our lives to Jesus where it belongs. And uh, because we need to give it to him because we're going to walk through this life that has all kinds of different struggles and, uh, and storms, so to speak, in this life. Uh, we saw last week that, you know, Jesus never promised any of his followers that this is going to be an easy life. <laughs> he, said, uh, he said the exact opposite. You're going to face all kinds of trials, and uh, you're going to face all kinds of troubles and storms, so to speak. And in John uh, 16, verse 33, it's right in the middle of kind of Jesus' farewell message and his prayers that he gives to his disciples uh, before he's arrested, and ultimately he's taken to the cross to be crucified for us. He promised us this. He said, I have told you these things, all of his teachings, all of his parables, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, be of good cheer, take courage, because I have overcome the world. So why does Jesus tell us this? He promises us this, that we're going to have trouble in this world. You know, if God is a good God, why would he allow anything bad to happen to his people? Well, we're going to look at why. Um, and it's for our good. It really is. And it, it brings us to this kind of a, a case study, this iconic trial by storm in, uh, in the life of these disciples that are following Jesus early in, in Jesus' ministry. And uh, so it's in Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27. We've got, it says, uh, so this is Matthew and Mark and Luke combined. All three of them, they kind of tell the same story, just in a little bit different ways. So what I did, I just, to put the whole story together, I kind of copy and pasted from Mark and Luke. So if it's confusing to you, I got everything color-coded, but hopefully that kind of puts the whole picture together for us this morning. Um, so that day, when evening came, he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. Suddenly, a furious storm came upon the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat, and he was nearly swamped. And they were in great danger. But Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. His disciples went to him and woke him, saying, Lord, and they say, teacher and master, they call on all kinds of different names, somebody, save us. We're going to drown. Don't you care if we drown? But he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And he got up, and he rebuked the winds and the waves, saying, quiet, be still. And it was completely calm. The men were in fear and amazed and asked, what kind of man is this that even the waves and the wind obey him? So you see three things happen here. First, the, the storm descends, the disciples freak out, and then the Lord steps in. And we're going to take a look at this. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you're going to recognize right away. You know what a storm is in your life. Um, they happen pretty frequently. And, you know, you have to recognize probably by now that these storms, conflict, opposition, uh, discomfort <laughs> when you're following Jesus, it's a normal thing. It's normal. Uh, in fact, First Peter, he reminds us, one of Jesus' disciples, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial or storm, uh, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But instead rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's suffering, <clears throat> that when the, his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So in fact, we see that there's only two types of Christians in this world. Christians who are going through a storm and those who are about to go through a storm. <laughs> Non-believers people who don't follow Jesus, they go through all kinds of storms too. But uh, we have something that the world does not. 
We have access to God. We have access to his peace, this peace that doesn't make sense, that surpasses all understanding. So we have hope. We have this help from the Holy Spirit as well. In Romans 5, uh, verses 3 through 5, it says, We also glory in our sufferings, in these trials, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint, is not put to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What an amazing promise. We also have God's word, which tells us no more and no less than 365 times, do not be afraid. So next year is a leap year. I'm going to give you one day to be afraid. (laughs) But we are, we're so created to enjoy peace. We are not created to worry. We're not created to worry or be afraid. Not created to be anxious. We're created to have peace. And God puts us through these storms and these trials for a reason. They're a good reason, and we're going to find out why. So let's look at it. We have, it's not if, but when the storm comes. How should we prepare? How should we react? And then how should we reflect? So how should we prepare? We'll look at verse 23 and 24. That day when evening came, they got into the boats. His disciples followed him. If you're going to underline anything in your Bible this morning, it should be that right there. The disciples followed him. And Jesus said to the disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. And then the furious storm came up on the lake, and the waves were swept over the boat, and they were in great danger. But Jesus was asleep on a cushion. Big chilling, as we say. Uh, So how should we prepare? Well, the first thing is follow Jesus. That's step one. In verse 23, Jesus got into the boat, and then his disciples followed him. So they followed him by by getting into the boat, but they also listened to him. They obeyed his command, his instruction. He said, let's go to the other side of the lake. Um, Because at this point, there there are all kinds of crowds kind of crowding around Jesus. He had just done all these miracles, all these healings, casting out all these demons, and this big crowd is starting to follow him. This is after uh, his time after the Sermon on the Mount that he just gave too. And uh, so he's pretty tired. Delivering a sermon is, is pretty hard work. Uh, you can ask Billy, but, you know, when I'm done, usually on a Sunday, I take one of those unintentional naps where you just hit the lever on the lazy boy and you rest your eyes for a minute. One of the best things. So I, I can relate to Jesus <laughs> in this point. He, uh, so one of the amazing things about the Bible is, is that we can, we can dig in and look at these stories and uh, just the incredible stories and people who are at the end of their rope in danger, but God came through and delivered them through each and every single one of these, these storms and these trials in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In our young adults group, we're going through the book of Exodus, and there's like, there's a storm on every page. <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild. Uh, but Greg glory. One of my favorite Bible teachers, he, uh, he says that there's three kinds of storms, which is really helpful for me to, to know this morning, is that to prepare for a storm, we can follow Jesus and then know that there's, there's three kinds of storms that we're going to face. There's the correcting storms, there's perfecting storms, and there's protecting storms. So correcting storms, they're the ones that pretty much we bring on on ourselves, <laughs> usually because of our own disobedience to the Lord. Um, well, what do I mean? I, I think... If you look at the book of Jonah, if you read the whole story of Jonah, it's a great example. God called Jonah to the city Nineveh, and so he, Jonah partially obeyed. He went to, he would got in a boat, but he went the opposite direction. <laughs> and uh, so God brought this storm into Jonah's life that leaves a lot of Bible readers kind of scratching their heads, myself included. This is one of the weirdest stories, where God brought this, this huge fish, this great fish, a whale, whatever you want to call it, uh, and it swallowed him up, and it brought him, spit him out at the right place back in Nineveh. And that was a storm. I'm sure Jenna, Jonah had plenty of time to think and pray while he was in the belly of that beast. And, uh, and when he came out of that fish, God brought him to the other side. He taught him a lesson. And uh, guess what? All the people that Jonah were so afraid of, the, the Ninevites, they ended up getting saved, all of them. It was a massive revival that broke out. They were chopping people's heads off and going crazy, and they said, yeah, we, we can't do this anymore. We've got to obey the Lord. Uh, so these kinds of storms, they come up in our own lives, too. And I know, you know, when we, when we don't obey the Lord, 
there's just, there's a design that God has created. He knows us so well because he made us. He knows how we best operate, and that's why he gave us his word. That's why he gave us his law. That's why we do what he says. But if we call ourselves a Christian and we do things the world's way, if we say we're going to go one direction, God calls us this direction, and we go the exact opposite, you know, the world's way. Everyone else is doing it, so I'm just going to go in. Don't expect it to be all sunshine and roses for you. Because <laughs> uh, you're going to bring something on yourself. Like, for example, if, uh, if you're going to move in with your boyfriend or girlfriend before you're married, just like everybody else is doing nowadays, uh, if you're going out partying, if you're going to spend time doing things you know you shouldn't, well, and you think it's harmless, <laughs> I would watch out. I would, I would watch out for a storm because... Uh, it's what we call a wake-up call. And uh, I recommend obeying the Lord before that storm comes. <laughs> uh, but I know I'm one of them. We need to learn the hard way sometimes. So then there's perfecting storms. Storms are, these are allowed, that the Lord allows us to, uh, to go through, which are designed to make us stronger spiritually. So the perfect example of this is Job. I think he is probably the undisputed champion of trial. He, uh, he, everything was taken from him, everything. He was left just with the clothes on his back, and he was given like this weird disease, these boils all over his body. Everybody rejected him. All his friends gave him terrible advice that the Lord hates you, and his wife tells him, curse God and die. But at the end of his life, he is so humbled, and he knows that uh, the Lord's going to bring him through the storm. He says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And if you ever get a chance to read that book all the way through, I recommend it. It's, uh, it's really worth the read. Kind of depressing at some points, but you'll make it through. Uh, another good example is Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis. He's rejected and he's beaten by his brothers, all 12 brothers, and uh, they sell him into slavery to the Egyptians. And he later, he ends up in jail for a crime that he didn't commit, but he ends up becoming second in command in Egypt to Pharaoh um, and reconciles with all his brothers. So we go through these storms too. They're called perfecting storms and that God allows us to, allows these trials to, to work out and chip away the edges of our character, um, to mold us and make us more in the likeness of Jesus, the way we're supposed to be. And uh, we know that these storms are, we know exactly what they are. <laughs> I think we've all been through them, but I think it's, it's important to recognize that uh, what these storms are. And we think these storms come at random. They never really do. <laughs> there's, there's a grand purpose from God behind all of this. In Romans 8.28, one of the most famous verses, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And that all things that Paul is talking about there, that's talking about what he calls early on in this chapter our present sufferings, which are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us in eternity. So we have something to look forward to through these trials. And this is the, the sanctifying work that God is doing in our lives before we are glorified in his, in his presence, in a glorified body. I'm excited for that. <laughs> it's what I like to call sanctification, the fun part of Christianity. The, uh, then there's pr protecting storms. So these are storms that are designed to protect us from something even worse. Um, if you look in the book of Acts, you'll see Paul. He goes through the Apostle Paul, not Paul the Bold. Uh, he goes through all kinds of storms and troubles, physical storms. He goes into prison. He's beaten several times. He gets... Uh, he goes through this, this literal storm. Him and 276 others are on this boat and they shipwreck. They end up on this, this island, Malta. And then he shipwrecks two more times. <laughs> it's a wild story. It, he, he can, you can read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I think it is. He kind of sums up all of his troubles in one little paragraph. He's like, man, it was worth it though, is what he says in the end. And you would think that, you know, all this is really bad. How could the Lord... Uh, do this to, to Paul. All he's doing, all he's trying to do is, is spread the gospel and share the good news about, about Jesus and forgiveness of sins. But then you realize that there's people constantly coming after him to kill him and, and take him hostage and beat him. 
So I think God used these prison bars not to keep Paul in, but to keep people out from from getting to him and killing him. And uh, he was able to preach the gospel even in the prison. Uh, But we go through the same things, and I'm sure I speak through for a lot of people here. Uh, When you endure the storm of of breakups, (laughs) they kind of suck. They really do. Sometimes right after, sometimes years later, you kind of realize that, you know, that's definitely not the person that the Lord had for you to marry. (laughs) Uh, In my own life, I believe God used some sort of a long-distance relationship while I was in Bible college uh, (laughs) to make sure that I was there for the right reasons, uh, to keep my eyes fixed on Him and focused on studying His Word and the calling that He had on my life. And... uh, also because Bible college girls are kind of crazy. They, there was one poor fella, my buddy, he said that in one semester, four different girls came up to him and said, the Lord told me we're going to get married. <laughs> yeah, that's not the Lord. That's, uh, that's called muy guapo. <laughs> so how should we prepare? We prepare by following Jesus. We obey what he says. And we expect storms to come. So live your life trusting Jesus, asking yourself, would I get in the boat? (laughs) I don't know if I would. Uh, But what happens next? We'll find out. But really quickly before we move on, I wanted to point something out just to give us some context of where they are, like literally, physically. uh, That's the Sea of Galilee. So it's interesting, if you read it, it says that day when evening came, there was this suddenly a furious storm came on the lake. Um, this wasn't uncommon in Galilee. It's pretty interesting. This uh, Sea of Galilee it has like 10 other names, like Lake Tiberius and other things I can't pronounce. But um, I, I was looking at a map and my wife was with me. She was like, that's it? <laughs> it's a tiny little lake. It's like eight miles across. I'm from Clear Lake and that's a, that's a big one. Um, but so what's interesting is this lake is 700 feet below sea level. And then this is where we get a lot of bananas from, actually, is in this region. Uh, and then surrounding in those mountains over there, from the north and the east and the west, uh, there's mountains that go from like 2,000 to 4,000 feet above sea level. So what happens is heat rises, right, from the low elevation. The heat rises from 700 feet below. And then the cool air from the east and in the north, it kind of comes in and rests in this little valley at the same time. So you get this sudden just with a little transfer of of heat and energy just going straight down as soon as the sun goes down. Uh, The hot and the cold fronts meet together. This is meteorology. My favorite channel growing up as a kid was the weather channel. I don't know why. It's just (laughs) a nerdy thing, I guess. Uh, It's a small lake. It's really small, but it had the perfect conditions for this storm. It's the perfect storm, in other words. So in this world, this fallen, broken world that we live in, it's, it's a perfect storm as well. Um, perfect conditions for all kinds of things to come our way. This world is cursed. It's cursed by sin. Uh, we see Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, that, that kind of ruined everything for the, this earth. Um, so of course things in our life are going to go wrong. It's a world full of selfish people with selfish motives. And, you know, there's, there's big storms, there's little storms. There's little storms like a sleepless night before a big day, or there's big storms like a two-year-long pandemic. But when, it's, when a storm comes, not if, but when, how should we react when we're in the storm? How should we react? The disciples, in verse 25, they woke him saying, Lord, teacher, master, save us. We're going to drown. Don't you care if we drown? And he replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? And he got up, he rebuked the wind and the waves, saying, quiet or peace, be still. And it was completely calm. So Jesus is sleeping on the boat, big chilling. And uh, they're going down. And I don't understand like how he's asleep. I know I get... You get tired, but I don't know if anyone's been that tired. <laughs> you're getting like some water splashed on your face and you're still asleep. Man, he must be, he must be confident. And you have to think that these are trained professionals. So James and John, they were in this family business with their father Zebedee, 
And then Peter and his brother, they had a, a professional fishing business too. So this is, uh, these are professionals out here. They know what they're doing. If anybody on that water the, this whole time during the storm knows how to uh, navigate this, it's them. But these men were, you know, they're, they're used to being out there all the time. So I just wonder how much time had passed before, you know, when the sudden storm came on until they woke Jesus. How long were they depending on their own strength? How long were they leaning on their own understanding before they realized they were sunk? This was a test for them. It was a heavy test. But notice they're, they're sinking. They're not swimming. <laughs> so they decide to wake Jesus. And they finally caved. And I like how each one of the different gospels, the three gospels, gives us a different name for Jesus. Lord, teacher, master, save us. We're going to drown. Don't you care if we drown? And the Greek word right there for drown, it, it really means perish or die. Like, Lord, don't you care if we die? We're going to die. We're dead. This is it. We're going down. When Jesus wakes up, you know, he responds, oh, man, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? And Jesus, one commentary says this, he uses this phrase to respond to his disciples' doubt that God would take care of them. And this weak faith contrasts what we learned a couple weeks ago with the great faith of the centurion, this Gentile who, you know, had never heard of, who never really read his Bible, but he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew who he, he says he would. Knew he was who he says he was. Thank you. Um, so Jesus is saying, why are you so afraid? I told you to get in this boat. I told you we're going to get to the other side. I didn't say we're going to go to the middle and drown. <laughs> And then Charles Spurgeon, I love this, it's clever. He says, he spoke to the men first, for they were most difficult to deal with. Wind and sea could be rebuked afterwards. The disciples, the disciples were leaning on their own understanding instead of trusting in the Lord with all of their hearts. So they did not recognize that when Jesus, when they acknowledged or submitted to Jesus, that he would make their path straight. Or in this case, he would make their storms calm. So remember these three things that are unfolding in this passage. The storm descended, the disciples are freaking out, and now it's time for the Lord to step in. And in verse 26, it says that he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, saying, peace, quiet, be still. And it was completely calm. Jesus steps in and he puts on this full display of his deity. This is, this is God in flesh. And uh, the only one, he's the only one who has the power to calm the sea because he's the one who created the sea. He knows how it works. That's probably why he's asleep. <laughs> and when Jesus says quiet or peace, be still, he says, the, the Greek word for that is literally like be muzzled, like a dog, like you put a, a muzzle on a dog. And uh, a dog is a lot more calm when it realizes he can't bark or bite. <laughs> so this miracle shows us that Jesus has complete authority over more than just our circumstances. So then how should we react? When we're in the storm, how do we react? Well, we should pray. We should call on him. Wake him up. The Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. And recognize that even in the midst of this storm, it is well. They can say it is well. It's, uh, it's better to just embrace the storm <laughs> than, to, than to freak out about it. Jesus said we're going to get to the other side. He didn't promise it was going to be still waters ahead. So when you're in the midst of a storm, how should you react? You should pray like you've never prayed and trust like you've never trusted. And that leads us to our last little point. How should we reflect? So when the storm is over, when it's calmed, these men were in fear. They were totally amazed. They marveled. And they asked, what kind of man is this? <laughs> Even the wind and the waves obey him. And his disciples reacted with, with fear and amazement when the Lord stepped in. And of course they were afraid because Jesus showed them he has authority over all the wind and the waves and all of creation. And anytime the word fear is used, you can, especially in this sense, you can almost replace it with the word reverence or respect this deep reverence and awe of the Lord. I can imagine there, there's this great sense of astonishment, just awe, wow. 
this, this reverence that only God deserves that they're giving for Jesus. And they, they had to ask themselves, who is this? Who is this guy? The wind and the waves obey him. Perhaps we should too. This was yet another fulfillment of prophecy. When I was studying, I, I found this and it was blowing me away. Another pro- uh, fulfillment of prophecy in the life of, and ministry of Jesus. And one of the most incredible praises, um, maybe the disciples had recited this, maybe they had this memorized. I would, I would love to know. But they said, in, not they said, but in Psalm 89, verses six through nine, it says, for who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty angels can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly feared, to be feared, revered, in the assembly of saints, that's us, and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When when its waves rise, you still them. Whoa. And that was written by David hundreds of years before. And I can imagine as well that the disciples felt this great sense of relief. (laughs) The storm is calmed. They realized who they were with, who they were serving, and they realized they're alive and they're afloat. They're not swimming. And when the storm is over, how should we reflect? In other words, how should we respond to the Lord? And uh, a very timely message once again. We respond with thanksgiving. We We reflect with our thanksgiving. The Lord has brought us through this. This is awesome. And we respond with our worship, our praise, adoration, whatever word you want to use. When the storms come in our lives, when they're calm and complete, we can look back and we respond with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for this storm. Thank you for what you showed me. Thank you for what you showed me about yourself, about myself, and uh, just what you're working out in me, making me more like you. And without this storm, we would, be, we would be corrected, or sorry, without the storm, we would not be corrected, we would not be protected, and we would not be being made perfect in the sanctifying work of the Lord. Also, it's, uh, it's very crucial to recognize that the harsher the storm, the more wild the storm, the greater the victory in the Lord. You know, it's not in my notes, but I was thinking this morning of uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, Gandalf, he had these eagles. He can call on these eagles, and they would just kind of swoop in and, and save the day after a while. And, you know, a lot of people asked J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of the books, he's like, well, how come you just, you know, didn't send Gandalf or somebody on the eagles and drop the ring down in there and destroy Mordor and all will be well. And uh, he basically said, get out of my face, you know. But you, you look at these, these three incredible books, these, this huge timeline, this huge story of, of all the trials they had to go through, all the storms, all the battles, all the losses and, and everything. That's what made it worth the story, especially in the ending when, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's, there's these four hobbits that are sitting there. They save, they save the whole world, basically. And uh, they have the king, the king of all of Middle Earth at, their, at that point there. And uh, everybody's bowing to the king. And the king looks back at them and he says, no, you guys bow to nobody. And so everybody bows down to them and it's this whole emotional moment. But if they didn't go through what they went through, that wouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have received that glory in the end from the king. So it's the same in our lives. God puts us through these things. I know without a doubt, there are hundreds of testimonies in here of how the Lord has brought us through crazy storms. I, I could be here all to the end of the year telling stories <laughs> about some of the past storms and trials in my life and, and how God has proven his faithfulness and his love to us over and over again and how he's been shaping us and making us more into his image. And I think of uh, Paul the Bolt. 98 years of being alive. He's only been a Christian for the last 75 years, you know, about three times my lifetime. <laughs> I'm sure he's got a story or two to tell. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he's been through some storms in his life. But it, it makes it even more humbling to talk with him. And he says, hey, can you pray for me on this, brother? Like, Oh, man. Or then we catch him walking up the stairs to go to Ray Simpson's class, the Digging Deeper class, and he says, 
why are you going to class, Paul? He's like, well, there's just so much more to learn. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the good things about storms is they don't last forever. It really helps us to, to keep this perspective that we are, we're eternal beings. This is, uh, they're temporary. And it gives us this perspective that there's so much more to our life than just life here on earth. In comparison to eternity spent with Jesus being perfected, a storm or two ain't so bad. So when, not if, but when the next storm comes, we can have this eternal perspective in mind. God has a plan. He wants to shape you. He wants to lead you. He wants to strengthen you through all of these storms. I want to close out by reading maybe one of the most comforting scriptures in the whole Bible. It's Isaiah 40. Towards the end, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak, especially in storms. Even youths, young people, grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But when those who hope in the Lord, even especially through the storm, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So when we're weary, when we're weak, when we stumble and fall through our storms, we can trust and hope in Jesus that he will give us the strength to make, us th- make it through every one of these storms. So let's pray. Let's pray that the Lord would give us the strength to prepare to react and to reflect when the storms come.